black, black guys come up in the big leagues today never heard of Jackie Robinson. That's the truth. Since the beginning of professional baseball, the black man was not allowed to play in the major leagues. A color line denied stardom to men like Josh Gibson, who could hit 70 home runs a season and batted over 400 several times. Cool Papa Bell, faster than Ty Cobb and with enough speed to score from first base on a bunt. And Satchel Paige, who pitched over 100 no-hit, no-run games in a career that spanned three decades. These men scratched out a living playing professional baseball on teams like the New York Black Yankees, the New York Cubans, the Newark Eagles, the Philadelphia Stars, the Homestead Grays, the Pittsburgh Crawfords. The Chicago American Giants, the Baltimore Light Giant, the uh, Cleveland Buckeyes. Birmingham ba Black Band, Memphis Red Sox, the Kansas City Monarchs. Black baseball talent was never wasted. It blossomed in Negro Leagues. Every spring, a caravan of black teams crisscrossed the country to play baseball. They took on all comers in major league ballparks while white teams were on the road and on the smallest backstreet diamonds. And when the seasons changed, the teams drifted south to play in Mexico and the Caribbean. Black baseball wasn't just a summer game. No, I never had an idea of uh, major leagues. I never had an idea. All I wanted to do was play baseball. And I believed that I could play baseball in the black league. In the early part of the century, black baseball was loose. There was no organization. Barnstorming teams often folded on the road if they couldn't make meal money. There were no rules to stop a player from jumping teams for the promise of more money. And while the diamond exploits of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig made them rich and famous, black ball players of equal ability had to survive on a dollar a day. But in the 1920s, Rube Foster took control. As manager of the Chicago American Giants, he organized black baseball's first viable league, which eventually evolved into the Negro National and American Leagues in the 1930s. Foster was black baseball's founding father. They were all super teams. There were no just bunch of boys just gotten together to throw a ball or swing a bat. They were really magnificent ball clubs. Eva Manley's life was black baseball. Her husband Abe was a gambler, a, a hustler, who owned the Newark Eagles in the 1930s and 40s. Mrs. Manley took an active part in team business, often telling the field manager who to pitch on a particular day. There's no question it was an accepted fact that Negroes just were discriminated against, and particularly in the South. And uh, I think everybody just took it in stride. They just didn't do, uh, let it affect them one way or the other. Thank God we had the Negro Leagues, or the Black Leagues, as you call them. Then they were the Negro Leagues. Thank God we had the Negro Leagues then to give guys like me a chance. Uh, it was a sort of a training ground. It was, in fact, all we had. In 1944, Don Newcomb began his baseball career as a 17-year-old pitcher with Eva Manley's Newark Eagles. Newcomb later became one of the first black ball players to play in the major leagues. That's why I never went to a major league game. Major league baseball didn't interest me because we had nobody there to look up to. I never had an idol in baseball. Never had an idol until Jackie Robinson came along, Roy Campanella. Now that's the strangest thing to say, that I never heard a Negro ball player in those days talk about playing in the major leagues because we always played them at the end of the season. They made up all-star teams and some of them intact and we always beat them. <laughs> The records will show that. We beat them always the majority of the games. David Malarger, Gentleman Dave, played for the Indianapolis ABCs and Rube Foster's Chicago American Giants in the 1920s. He was one of the best infielders of all time and later one of the game's cagiest managers. 
I never sat in any but one place during all of my managerial career. I never stood up on the field. I never moved my seat. I never went any place during a ball game except in that one spot where every player could find me on the field. So you I directed every play. The big event every year in black baseball was the East-West All-Star Game, which began in 1933 at Comiskey Park in Chicago. That was the same year the Major Leagues held their first All-Star Game, also at Comiskey Park. The East-West Game attracted large crowds that came to see black baseball's best. The game proved that great baseball talent, despite phantom status, did exist in the Negro Leagues. Oh, we had men about a... We had men about a hundreds could have made the big league for that concern. About a hundreds, not about a four twos or threes. About a hundreds could. They had more, they had a lot of such pages out there. Men could throw the ball hard as me. Many say that he is the greatest pitcher that ever played the game. Satchel Page is a living legend. He dominated black baseball in the 1930s and the 40s. Satchel pitched in more than 2,000 ball games, give or take a few hundred. But he still had to wait until he was 42 years old to become the Major League's oldest rookie in 1948. And anybody ever seen me throw, they tell you I could throw pretty straight. I couldn't. I came up from down in Mobile when I was throwing rocks like you heard them say. I could throw rocks straight. I used to kill bird with rocks. There's no maybe so about it. Their baseball skills were magnificent, but the life was gritty. An endless chain of dirt roads, colored hotels, and beaneries. Negro baseball, like all of black existence at the time, was relegated into its own isolated world. I, I don't like to talk to people about my baseball days because they were weird so far as you youngsters are concerned. And you can't believe that some of the playing conditions that we had to go through. Ted Page, a lanky left-handed outfielder, was one of black baseball's quickest base runners in the 1930s. He is best known as a member of the New York Black Yankees and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. You asked me about traveling, and I'll tell you, yeah, we ride all night. But you, that doesn't explain that. That don't really explain what the problem that we had. We ride all night. So what? You ride all night. A lot of people ride all night. But this, you, you can't gather really with the problem we had or how tough it was. And to us, it wasn't tough. I mean, it was part of our life. We couldn't stay in good hotels, you know. And no blacks were staying in good hotels at that time. And um, we stayed in rooming houses and, and around in, in, uh, in the residential section. Buck Leonard of the Homestead Grays was called the Black Lou Gehrig in the 1930s and 40s, but he never shared Gehrig's celebrity. Leonard played a great defensive first base, besides displaying awesome ability at the plate. And even though he never played in the major leagues, Buck Leonard was elected to the Major League Hall of Fame by a special vote in 1972. And in some of those places where we stay, were staying in rooming houses, bedrooms were bad. I remember in New Orleans one night, uh, we were in the bed, and as soon as we got in the bed, the bedrooms were waiting for us. And they, when we turned out the light, bam, they started biting. I don't think you can hardly name a, a small town or coal mining town uh, that I didn't play in. We even made baseball diamonds. Went to, uh, little towns that made baseball diamonds, and the fence was the cause. The cause uh, just got all the way around us, way out in outfield out there, and made a fence, and we would pass the hat around. We loved to play. We wanted to play. Uh, baseball was our game. And uh, it didn't mean no, it, uh, we hated the conditions, certainly. We hated not getting but 60 cents a day on which to eat, and 75 cents and all like that. But we loved to play, and we wanted to play. When you're doing something that you love to do, there's nothing lousy about it. And to me, I thought it was the first step toward going to the top of the world. The black newspapers called five-foot, eight-inch Jimmy Crutchfield the mighty might from Moberly, Missouri. 
Crutchfield played right field in the 1930s and 40s for the American Giants and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And then you've got to leave home plate with the idea of going to second base. Otherwise, you can't run to first base, and then if the guy bobbles the ball, make up your mind to go to second. You've got to leave home plate with the intention of going to second base. That's what they call coming to the park to play ball. They put me in the ball game to catch, too. In fact, that was, I think, my first night game. They had little lights in Beach Haven, New Jersey. And I caught, and I'll never forget riding to New York after the game in the bus, and they were getting ready to go through what the Holland Tunnel. So the other players on the team asked me, did I have a gas mask? And I said, no. He said, well, you know, going through the tunnel, you need a gas mask. So. Life was always tough on a rookie, even if your name was Roy Campanella. Campy began his career with the Baltimore Elite Giants of the Negro National League in 1937. Ten years later, he went on to become a Hall of Fame catcher with the Brooklyn Dodgers before a paralyzing auto accident cut short his career in 1958. I was 15 now. So then at the hotel, that Saturday morning when I got up, so what, the general manager of the team, McGowan, asked me, did I make up my bed? I said, no. I said, well, you leave a bad reputation for the team. You got to go upstairs and make your bed up. So I got the elevator and upstairs I went and made my bed up. I come back down. So he said, look, I have a bucket here. Go downstairs and get me a bucket of steam. So I said, OK. So on my way, I said, how am I going to get a bucket of steam? <laughs> and that's when I started to realize these guys was pulling something on me. Uh, one other thing, too, you know, they used to dust us off a lot, you know, threw the ball out of our face, or head, or anywhere, see. And uh, we had that to think about. And uh, at that time, we weren't wearing any helmets. And then neither were they putting uh, pictures out of the ball game for throwing that if you all finding them. And uh, we, had, we had to learn how to duck as well as hit. So that put some mess on your mind, see. Yeah, I think I punched a guy once. I punched a ball player one time. And by the way, it was down in Long Island who was playing. I played, punched the ball player, played first base when I went down. Instead of him tagging the bag this way, he stuck his foot out and I went over him. And I tripped over him. And I come back to the bag and racked him up. <laughs> there will be nobody fighting on this ball club. I said, is we gonna be friends? We are gonna be brothers? That was the first lecture that I gave them when I was made manager. And I said, the first thing, there'll be no dissension to cause anybody to wanna fight each other. And I said, the first man that strikes the first blow is fired. <laughs> and you'll never play baseball on the American Giants or on any other team in the league. If he starts a fight or anything, I say, we're going to be brothers. And it was just that way. Black ball players shared a camaraderie that was common among athletes. And the Black Leagues represented a special fraternity for those who were blessed with baseball ability, but forced to live behind the color line. There is one man's story that stands out as a symbol of all hidden baseball genius that developed behind that color line. His name was Josh Gibson. And he was a baseball artist. He was a game's greatest hitter, better than Babe Ruth. His tape measure homers often exceeded 500 feet. His home run production soared to 60 and 70 a season. Josh Gibson's life is a story of a man born too soon. His abilities eroded before he ever got a chance to play in the major leagues. From 1930 to 1946, Josh found an identity in baseball. He was born to play the game. Josh was uh, one of the greatest hitters of all time. If only people could have seen Josh hit the baseball. Now, he was the greatest hitter 
that we ever ever had in the black leagues. He was the greatest hitter. He could hit the longest ball of anybody that we had in the black league. The best hitter I've ever seen, I, and I, I being a pitcher, uh, would would should be reluctant to say that, but he is, uh, he, and he was the best hitter I've ever seen. I've seen Ted Williams, Sam Musial, Willie Mays, and Henry Aaron. I've never seen a hitter like Josh Gibson, because you could fool Josh Gibson with the pitch, and he could swing, be swinging the bat, and his momentum would, would make one hand fly off the bat. With one hand, he could hit a home run, hit the ball right center field, hit a home run. And I've seen it happen many times. It happened against me. He could hit and throw and run. Yes, sir. The first time I saw Josh was in 1944. Well, he was a outstanding star. He was an outstanding star. And I'm a young third baseman in the league, and we playing him in Washington, D.C. And uh, I don't know Josh from nobody else. I just hear the guys saying to Josh, I'm with the Birmingham Black Bands. Sam Hairston, now a White Sox farm instructor, remembers the first time he got a good look at Gibson. Bunt signal was uh, in, in order, you know, and uh, Josh was up. So I don't know Josh from nobody else. So I breaks in for the bunt, and Josh don't swing. He hollered over to the manager. He said, hey, what y'all trying to do, get this guy killed? And the manager looked and saw me. He said, time, get back, get back, way on the edge of the grass. And I got on back on the edge of the grass, and Josh swung. In the, the ball, I did like this, and the ball went right across my chest. A one hopper to the left field, <laughs> right across. If I had been in, I'd have got killed. As a youngster, coming along and being able to play against a guy like Josh Gibson, I looked up to him and always will. <laughs> oh, man, he is awesome. I remember one year in Mexico, we were playing, and we had a Mexican fella pitching for us. And I told him, we get together, you know, we talk about the hitters in the clubhouse, just like anything. And I said, now, this guy, you got to pitch away from him, down. We keep the ball down on him all the time. Keep the ball down. I said, don't get it up, because if you do, he can hurt you. So Quincy Troop was a solid hitting catcher and a manager in the Negro Leagues for the Cleveland Buckeyes. And for 15 years, he told pitchers what not to throw to Gibson. So he wanted to throw the curveball. And in center field was 450. I, I got the picture in my scrapbook. Shows you center field, 450. Uh, behind that is about far from here, almost across the street over there. And a Coca-Cola sign. That's where he hit it, off of this guy. And he had to know that he would have been a superstar in Major League Baseball. He had to realize that himself. He didn't do too much talking about what he's going to do. He wasn't the, the braggart type of kid, you know. You find guys who will say, I'm what they're going to do long before they ever did it, and maybe they'll never make it. But not, uh, not Josh, he wasn't that type. He went to Mexico and played. And when Josh come back, uh, he took sick and uh, I talked to him a lot in Washington, but I never could find out exactly what went wrong with Josh. He got to be an alcoholic and, and all of that. I think he just drank and drank, and that's probably what happened. All of a sudden, if you were a great star and you thought that you were going to go on forever and you're not prepared for anything else in life, and then you find that you don't have it anymore, you don't have any money, all of that works on the guy's mind. Josh Gibson died of a stroke in the winter of 1946. He was 35 years old. The color line collapsed in that same year. Branch Rickey, owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, signed a second string infielder named Jackie Robinson from the Kansas City Monarchs. Finally, black ball players could get a chance to prove themselves in the big leagues, but for many, the occasion was only a sad reminder that they had been born too soon. Branch Rickey Jr., a Pittsburgh Pirate executive, remembers why his grandfather took a chance on Robinson. I would have to say that it was a hunch. Uh, Robinson had the college education. 
He had the, the exposure to the military. Uh, he had operated and functioned in uh, formal systems. And he had been a star already. He had been an established star uh, in his college football days. And then I think Grandpa was in his personal uh, interview with him. He was just so impressed with him as a person. I'm so sure about that, that it was not just that he wanted a, a colored man at the time. He picked Jackie Robinson because Jackie Robinson was a college man. He knew he had a nice, good contact. But the thing that I'm sure made them decide to put Negroes in the major leagues was money. I, I would think that Jackie was an ideal man because I can think of some of the guys in that wouldn't have done as well <clears throat> mentally, because I can think of some guys that would not have taken the abuse that Jackie took. I know Jackie was the right guy, and I will say a thousand times, I'm glad it wasn't none of me, because I couldn't have took it. I know, I, I know good and well I couldn't have took it. We had to. We, we, had, to, we had to endure the, the, uh, the uh, uncomfortable uh, things that came into our lives, because, man, we had a job to do. And uh, Jackie was, uh, was the father. He was the father of, of the whole program. And what he did and what Roy Campanella did and what Don Newcomb did uh, was predicated upon uh, our abilities as men to, to, uh, to do the job that Branch Rickey had put his life and reputation on the line for, to do. And uh, we, we, we had to take it. Branch Rickey had more to offer those 16 prejudice owners than just a little black boy. He had all those 50,000 black fans. I said, that's what put him in the major leagues. And as soon as, as that happened, what happened? The major leagues went after all of the ball players. They <laughs> raided all the Negro teams uh, to get the ball players that they knew were able to play major league baseball. The day that Mr. Ricky took those boys, the fans all deserted us to go see the Negro players on the white teams. And it, I begged Abe to quit that net, that first year. I begged him, oh, oh we dropped another $20,000. That was a nice little piece of money in those days. <laughs> and he was a gambler. So, of course, to him it didn't mean anything, and he wouldn't quit. You know, very few people know that Jackie came near to having nervous breakdown after the 1947 season because of the... Uh, abuse that he had to take, and he couldn't release this this inner feeling because uh, of the of the very fact that Branch Rickey told me you have to you have to keep your mouth shut. I often think now in my wheelchair, back supposing it wasn't a success when the Dodgers first integrated baseball with black players, what would it be today if it wasn't a success then? I don't know. Several years ago, I was talking with a kid, and I had my, I was up in Michigan during the summer, I had my glove, I was talking with the kid, and, and uh, as I say, a lady told the boy, I said, oh, he used to be a baseball player. And the kid started talking with me, because I never heard of you. <laughs> I said, well, I came along about the time of Jackie Robinson, the guy said, Jackie Robinson? He hadn't heard of Jackie Robinson. All he knew was Willie Mays. Suffering from the depletion of talent, the Negro Leagues died in the early 1960s. Like Josh Gibson, its demise went as unnoticed as its heyday. Black ball players lived and loved their game. And today, they still speak about baseball with a passion unspoiled by the years. Because that's the Homestead Grays, and that's my number, 32. Now, this is a flannel uniform, and it's hard as the devil during the summer. And you can see the, the pants, the kind of pants that we use, they had rubber in the bottom of them, and the blouse, and the folks still kidding me about it. Now, when I go to the Old Timers game, I wear this, and uh, they are uh, still kidding me about how the pants look on me uh, since they blouse. Listen, if I had them to live over again, uh, I would do it. 
I had more fun in life, I believe, in, as anybody in the world with less money. And I saw more of the world and uh, saw as much as the world as anybody got as much money as Rockefeller, if you want me to tell you the truth. And if I had to pay the money to go over those spots, I'd have to have me a truck or something like that, uh, you know, care behind me uh, the places that I have been. And when the bull went out of the park, I got the biggest thrill. <laughs> there was something about that bull sailing out of the park that just, I don't know what it did to you. Uh, Every time I uh, look on TV or pick up a paper and read about some kid that I've had something to do with, this is the pay. This is the thing that really makes me proud of myself. I had a dream the other night. I singled off of a left-handed pitcher across second base, and I just kept running, but I never could get to first base. That's tough, I'm telling you. I just kept running, and I kept running, and I knew the guy was going to throw me out eventually, but I couldn't get to first base. It's nice to have dreams. You know, I guess I'm a dreamer. Sometimes I ride along on my job and I have much to do. I think of what I might have done. But then they, everybody does. All, everybody wants to dream about his future or what he could have done during the, you know, in the past. But, uh, I can't believe that I would be any worse than some of the ball players we have in the major leagues. Black baseball was both great and sad, a bittersweet era. All that remains are the memories and stories of those who rode all night to play the game. <laughs>